Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I'll go over an introduction of time series databases. At first, we will talk about what is time series data and what are some examples of it. Then we'll take a look at what makes time series data unique and how is it different from other relational data. From there, we will look at a few example queries that can be efficiently answered by time series databases. These queries are not performant in other databases, such as relational, document, or graph. Finally, we're going to wrap it up by looking at some existing time series databases that are being used in various companies. So with that being said, let's get started. By definition, time series database is a database purpose-built to store time series data. That means when you design a time series database, the storage engine is designed from ground up with only time series data in mind. That's because time series data comes with its own unique uh, properties and challenges. That brings us to the question, what exactly is time series data and how is it different from any other data that we have in our databases? By definition, time series data is a sequence of data points over a time interval. So let's say you can have a interval of 10 minutes. All the data that are coming into the system within this 10 minutes are going to be in, in increasing time. So let's say you have one data point at minute one, the next minute two, the next minute three. So every data that is coming into your system is associated with a timestamp and more commonly the data is only coming in in the order of increasing time so if the first data that you get is from minute one the next one is going to be from minute two there are cases when the data can be out of order but more often than not the time series data tends to be uh, the, according to the actual time so this is an example of a table that contains some time series data. Over here, you can see the table has four fields, ID, timestamp, air quality, and temperature. For example, you can uh, look at this as data coming from some kind of a sensor that is measuring the air quality and temperature at a particular location. If you focus on the timestamp field, you can see all of them are very similar except the last digit, which is the uh, lowest unit of time. So you can see the first row has one and then two, three and four. That means the data that's coming into the database is an increasing time. And you have the air quality and temperature, which are, which are the metrics that the sensor is measuring. So you get those information with a timestamp all the time. So this is a pretty good example of how time series data looks like. The takeaway from this is every row has a timestamp associated with it. And that's what makes this a time series data. So let's talk about a few examples of time series data. The first one I have is sensor data, which is the example we just looked into. These are very commonly time series database because sensors are designed to emit data every second or every millisecond. So if you have a sensor, no matter what it's measuring, the sensor will be emitting data every second or every millisecond. Perfect exa example of a time series data. Then we have weather data. If you have uh, some kind of an instrument that's measuring what how the weather is like, what the temperature is like over time, that tends to be time series data because every measurement of the weather is associated with a timestamp. The next one is system monitoring data. This is one of the most common use cases of time series data. Uh, an example would be uh, the temperature of your laptop over a period of time or the CPU usage of your laptop over a period of time. 
If you're talking about servers, you can look at a queries per second over a period of time, number of er errors that's coming into your system over a period of time. All these are uh, different uh, metrics concerning system monitoring, and all of them tend to have an associated timestamp so that you can see the changes over time. We also have website activity data. If you have a web app that people are visiting uh, every day, you can track the activities of the users within your website. So you can uh, use their IP or some other data to see if the same users are coming into your system uh, every day or every month or with what frequency are people coming. Or uh, if you have an associated timestamp with every click, you can see the user flow, how your user is interacting with your website over a period of time. So uh, website activity data is a very good example of time series data. And more commonly, you can look at stock prices. Uh, any stock price is associated with the time. Uh, over a given day, the stock price changes with time. It can go up and down. So if you are, uh, maybe you're writing a script or maybe you were just using an API, but every time you call the API or scrape a website for stock price, this price is gonna be associated with the time and you can take a look at how the stock price is changing over a period of time. So now that we have looked at a few examples of what time series data looks like, let's see what makes it unique. Like uh, the data must be unique that we're talking about a purpose-built database just to store this kind of data. So let's take a look at what exactly makes time series data unique. So the first property of its uniqueness is uh, time series databases tend to have very high write throughput. Just think about uh, the examples we just went through. The first one we talked about was sensor data. The way sensors are designed, they are designed to measure whatever they're supposed to measure more than once every second. And if you're writing all, the, all these data into the database, your write throughput is going to be very, very high. Same for a, a website activity tracker, right? If you have multiple web, uh, users coming to your website very, very often, your write throughput is going to be very high. Stock prices, very similar. Depending on how granular you want your data to be, you want to be uh, calculating the stock price every second or maybe more than once every second. Once again, very, very high write throughput. Your writes in a time series database can be regular or irregular. So you can have a regular write where let's say your sensor emits data uh, five times every second. So every second, you're gonna have five writes into your database. That's how a regular write is gonna look like. You can also have irregular writes. Let's say you have a sensor connected to the internet, but the sensor is uh, intermittently losing connection and establishing connection again. So the data the sensor emits is not going to be in regular intervals. You might get sudden bursts, bursts of data. Uh, so we, you can have either of the pattern uh, in a time series database. The data needs to be highly compressed in a time series database. Uh, that's because if you looked at the examples, every row is associated with a timestamp. However, every row is going to be very similar to each other. So the data in uh, a time series database tends to be very similar when you compare row by row. And just by the sheer volume of data that you need to write into these databases, you want your data to be highly compressed so that you're not using a ton of space. That's a very important consideration when you're using a time series database, because if your sensor or any other source of data uh, writes a ton of data every minute, you want the database to compress your data so that uh, if you have to do 40 million rows in a given day, you don't use the data that 240 million rows in a MySQL database uh, would take, because that would be very, very inefficient. The next one is uh, in a time series database, it's very common to have large range scans of many records. 
Uh, let's look at an example. Let's say you have data for over a month worth in your database and you want to look at the average price of a stock over a month. To look at the average price over a month, you would have to go through all the rows you wrote to your database over 30 days. That's a lot of rows that you have to go calculate and then find the average or the maximum or the minimum. So it's very common in a time series database to have queries that scan bunch of bunch of records at once. The next one is a right to latest time entry only. We already talked about it before, but uh, more commonly in a time series database, the chances are every time a piece of data comes in, it's associated with the current time. So as as you keep writing to the table, you only keep writing uh, with increasing time. So you don't write past data, you only write present data. And then the next data is gonna be with the timestamp associated. Uh, the associated timestamp is gonna be the next minute. Uh, so you don't really write historical data, you write the current data more often than not. And lastly, you want native support for things like summaries, aggregations, or rollups. Uh, later on, we're gonna take a look at a few common time series queries that the database lets us uh, get the results of. And you want these queries to be natively supported. You don't wanna do fancy joins or fancy clauses to get these um, data from the table because you want every read uh, to be very, very performant. We're gonna talk about all these uh, aggregation summaries and rollups in a later slide. So that's what makes the time series data and time series databases unique. So now let's take a look at some queries that a time series database can help us answer. We can get the daily stock price of Amazon. So let's say you have uh, in your database, you have the price of Amazon stock over one year. What you can do is you can look at the average price for every day uh, over, a, over a year. And this query can be very, very performant in a time series database. Whereas if you were doing a group by or average in MySQL or some other relational database, the query would work, but it would take a long time. Another example is the daily average temperature in San Francisco. Uh, let's say you have a database full of temperature reading all over the, from all over the world and you wanna see a chart of how the daily average temperature changed over a period of year. Very easy in a time series database to run this query and get the result in a very short amount of time. Similarly, you can have unique website visits every month. Let's say your database uh, logs one line into your database every time someone visits the website. Using a query, you can uh, chart how many visits you're getting every month for, uh, on your website. In a relational database, you can do the same thing, but it's gonna be way less performant than it's gonna be in a time series database. You can also look at the highest revenue months in the last five years. Uh, let's say in the database, every row is the amount of revenue you are uh, getting on a daily basis. Using a time series database, you can roll it up by month every year and then look at which month uh, in which year was your highest revenue month. And you can also look at things like the average Uber ride prices by city. So let's say you have a database where you have uh, each row is one Uber ride with the associated price. So you can group by city, and after grouping by city, you can look at the average price in uh, Uber ride per city. So you can get very, very granular with your time data, and this wouldn't have been possible in a relational database or a document database or even a graph database. Uh, we just looked at a few of the examples, but as you can imagine, the use case can be whatever you can think of, and time series databases are built to answer any question you have related to uh, time data. 
So what are some time series databases that are used right now in production? So the first four are purpose-built time series databases. We have QuestDB, TimescaleDB, InfluxDB. All three of them can be used uh, very easily. Some of them are open source, some of them have companies behind them. And then we have uh, a typical Amazon offering called TimeStream. This is a cloud uh, database which is managed by AWS and very performant on uh, when it comes to storing or reading time series data. The last one is Cassandra, which is an open source NoSQL database that you can use for multiple use cases. When it comes to Cassandra, Cassandra is uh, very good at uh, time series data, but your data model will have to be designed with that in mind. You can make it perform very well, but you would need to put in the work to design the best schema before you start writing uh, to Cassandra. For the other four that I have, they are more out of the box. So you can just connect to your uh, application and start writing to it immediately and it should work perfectly. Whereas for Cassandra, you would need to put some manual work to uh, get the best performance out of it. And yeah, that's all I had for you all today. Hopefully this was a good introduction to time series databases and why we need them. In a future video, I am gonna go deeper into one of the databases and show you how you can ingest data into it, how you can run different queries and compare the performance of these databases to that of uh, maybe a MySQL, Postgres or MongoDB. So hopefully you'll check it out when I uh, release that one. Uh, hopefully the video was helpful. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. With that being said, hopefully you learned something and I'll catch you all in the next one. Bye-bye.